I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is not their first time joining us here uh, for a Dev, uh, DevOps Days uh, based in, in Ukraine. I would like to introduce Chris Nova, Senior Principal Engineer at Twilio. Uh, Chris is going to be speaking about a bootkit, which is delightfully named <laughs> project. <laughs> uh, so advanced TCP penetration with eBPF and Linux kernel. If, if, you're, if you're familiar with eBPF, you're going to love this. If you're not familiar with eBPF, you're going to love it even more. Uh, so once again, uh, Chris Nova, thank you so much for joining us and I will hand it over to you. So um, thank you for having me again. This is my second time back. I think last time I was here, I spoke about Falco with eBPF and uh, I certainly was not expecting to, to be back again this year uh, when the year started. And I certainly was not expecting to be um, talking about what I'm talking about today when this year started. So it's, it's, it's my great honor uh, to be here and to be a part of this and to support Ukraine and support DevOps Days. Uh, DevOps Days is really important to our family. We uh, we run the DevOps Days in Buffalo, where we live. And uh, it, again, this is just really, really my honor to be here. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, my my root kit that I wrote. Um, and we'll talk about how, how I, it came to be, why it's here. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, how a DevOps organization would be able to leverage a tool like this and uh, hopefully learn a little bit about eBPF, what it can do and, and what to be on the lookout for as the, the Kubernetes and container space inevitably moves into uh, the new world of eBPF in the future. So hopefully when we're done with this, you should have a good understanding of um, how this all fits together. So I wanna make sure everybody can see my screen. Daniel, if you wanna just give me a quick thumbs up. Yep, there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, we're gonna jump right into it. So as per usual, um, <laughs> I run Linux. So uh, everything I'm doing today, the way that Zoom is set up is gonna be confined to our Linux terminal, which is a feature, definitely not a bug. Um, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about Bootkit and then I'll, I'll give a small demo and it'll be running in the, uh, the rack that is right here behind me. Um, so let's, let's jump right into it. So um, the talk will be about Boopkit, which is an advanced TCP penetration with eBPF in the Linux kernel. So let's get right into it. Um, so on February 24th, um, I think this, this day was, was very hard for us. We have some, some friends and family over in, in Kiev and in, in Lviv right now. And uh, we had been watching closely as, as all of this, this occurred over, over the internet. And uh, I began getting very involved with the open source intelligence community uh, just to stay in the loop with what was going on. Um, so as I began developing those relationships and following along closer with uh, the events in Ukraine, uh, I began to develop some, some important cybersecurity contacts in the uh, Ukrainian private sector uh, for cybersecurity, who later led to some relationships with some folks in the Ukrainian government. Um, so as all this began to unfold, um, I discovered a bug bounty program. And uh, you know, at the time I was just looking for something to do uh, as I've, I've kind of moved forward with, with everything that's been happening. Uh, I noticed that a lot of people, especially overseas, uh, wish there was more that they could do while they're stuck at home. And, and this was something that I discovered with the support of my, my loving partner uh, that I was able to, uh, to actually help out with some of the effort going on uh, in Ukraine. So uh, I had sent out a tweet um, where I had discovered an, an, a known vulnerability and helped with some, some research here. And uh, without saying too much into exactly what happened on the back end, some, some relationships were made and some conversations were had. And it, it became very apparent very quickly that I had some expertise with eBPF. And uh, some of the folks that I was I were ta I was talking to at the time had a lot of questions with for myself, um, you know, as we were exploring, you know, what would it look like if we were if we were to take on um, any sort of cyber attack in Ukraine and in uh, any private organization's infrastructure? First of all, what are the types of attacks we should be looking for? And second of all, um, what would be a persistent strategy that somebody could implore to to actually sustain an attack after something has happened? So without getting too much into the detail of how a lot of these cyber attacks work, malware is is front of mind, right? Once, once somebody gets into a system, if, if they're able to persist to that connection, um, that's a large concern. So we had a lot of questions about um, what various types of malware could look like. And I think uh, 
what what was most exciting about my background was my ability to offer traditional tactics that are usually done with kernel modules inside of Linux, um, specifically with with eBPF. And we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly we can do and, and how eBPF works um, as we move forward. So somebody asked me, you know, Nova, what can eBPF do exactly? And I said, well, it can do a lot of things. It can do pretty much anything you want. There's there's somebody who once said that eBPF is basically JavaScript for the Linux kernel. Um, so we began to kind of talk through some various scenarios. And we talked about building a rootkit. And I talked about the ability to obfuscate PIDs at runtime. Um, we talked about the ability to overload Docker images and to even overload the SHA of a Docker image uh, on a system so that, you know, all the runtime tools running in user space would actually think that you're running the container image you think you are while you're actually running a malicious image. Uh, we talked about the ability to do syscall interception or system call hijacking. We talked about polymorphic executables, DNS, uh, BPF obfuscation, and the list goes on and on. What all of this means to somebody in the DevOps community is that eBPF is extremely powerful. And it allows us to, to synthesize or hijack different parts of the kernel we potentially would not be able to hijack in the past, at least not with doing something like LD preload or using a kernel module. So the pattern here that I think we're all very familiar with, with in DevOps is as technology grows, it eventually reaches this point of where it's so flexible that you be can begin to do extremely powerful things with it. And when you begin to be able to do extremely powerful things, there's an extremely high risk of those powerful things being used for malicious intent. So that was a lot of what my conversations with folks in Ukraine were uh, at the beginning of February going into March. Um, and so I had found a few examples. There's there's a good one here from somebody, uh, Path to File, where they talk about bad BPF. And this is a much more comprehensive example for, for anyone who is interested in really seeing uh, all of the plethora of attack vectors and pieces of functionality you could use here. Uh, the one for this example that we wrote with BoopKit is very specific to a, a very specific concern that a few corporations in, in Ukraine had as I began assisting them. Uh, so there was a question that was asked, which was, uh, would they be able to exploit a server with a single SYN packet? And uh, I, I can't give away too much detail on why uh, this was the concern, but the point being was that uh, if a, a single SYN packet entering a network was capable of exploiting a server using eBPF, what would that look like? And as we began talking, it became very apparent very quickly that there was no good example of this out there. So my, my answer was, well, yes, of course you could do something like that. You know, there's a couple of ways you could do it. You could, you know, embed the data in a TCP packet and so on. And as I began explaining, it became apparent that uh, a concrete example would actually be useful. So after a few discussions, uh, we decided that it would be it would be helpful if I was to actually go out and build a piece of malware that we could use to test our systems and to demonstrate the technology. I also think that from an intellectual perspective, being able to do this publicly demonstrated that there was a, an open awareness of this vector, which helped to ease the minds of some of the folks I was working with directly by making it extremely well known. You alleviate the chance that it becomes extremely unknown. So uh, I decided to write a tool called BoopKit, where the single SYN packet that we would be sending across uh, a network would be referred to as a boop, which of course we named after my adorable puppy. Shayokik uh, Bjorn is his name, but we call him Bjorn. Um, so we wrote an eBPF rootkit. And when I say we, I mean, I, I wrote it live on my Twitch stream and folks on Twitch helped and folks uh, that I was working with had reviewed the code and, and followed along and, and had some questions as we began developing. So we're going to talk very concretely about how this works and how you would be able to defend, a bit, defend against it in a production environment uh, moving forward. So there's two user space programs here. And for folks who are a little new to kernel development, there's kind of two worlds that you need to imagine. There's kernel space, which is uh, a very obscure world where normal computer science rules uh, don't necessarily apply the same as they do in user space. And then there's user space, which is what users like you and me would be interacting with as we, we talk to Linux. Um, so anything you can run on a command line is basically what, what most people refer to as user space. So we have two programs written in C. We have one called boopkit boop, and we have one called boopkit. 
Um, and there are four uh, different probes that these user space tools will interface with. And an eBPF probe is basically a, uh, a small piece of bytecode <clears throat> that can be dynamically loaded directly into the kernel. So if you're <clears throat> familiar with kernel modules, you would compile a kernel module and then you can insert the kernel module using insmod or a few other tools. Uh, an eBPF probe can actually do that at runtime from within the context of a program. So a, you could start a user space program and you would be able to inject your bytecode directly into the kernel uh, and you can make that bytecode do pretty much whatever you want. There's a few limitations about how the eBPF virtual machine works, but for all intents and purposes, you can just copy data up to user space. And then once it's in user space, you can do whatever you want to with it. Uh, so in order for us to adhere to our single send packet constraint, uh, we started to explore various TCP uh, eBPF probes. And uh, this became very exciting to us as we continued to do our research because we quickly realized that if we're able to intercept TCP packets using one of these T TCP uh, these TCP probes, it doesn't matter what is running on the server. We would be able to uh, intercept the packet and perform uh, a remote command execution against the server. So what this means to DevOps engineers is if there is anything running with TCP, Nginx, Kubernetes, um, you know, MongoDB, uh, MySQL, you know, any TCP service is potentially liable for us to be able to uh, send our RCE, our remote command execution payload through the service directly into the kernel based off of how the Linux kernel works. Um, and, and we'll give an example of, of actually booping a server over SSH, un unauthenticated SSH uh, here in a moment. Uh, we have a few dependencies that are important to call out because these, this needs to be compiled on the server. So this was a big takeaway that, that we learned as we were going through the process, which was um, if you can get GCC and Clang off of your servers, it's gonna dramatically limit the possibility of somebody potentially building malware like this, as uh, all of these probes are specific to the kernel version that you have installed. Uh, so here's kind of a model of how the whole thing works. Okay, we have this, uh, this variable that we call RCE, which is our remote command execution payload. And we had a Linux 5.17 uh, computer here. So I run Arch Linux, by the way, if that wasn't already <laughs> apparently obvious. And um, we were looking at newer kernels um, as our primary target that we were defending against. Um, so with a, a relatively recent kernel, uh, we were able to compile our programs and get our, our BPF probes injected into the kernel at runtime. So bootkit will start itself. Uh, and again, this is just a normal program running on a computer and it'll start two threads. Um, one thread will actually go and inject the, the eBPF probes directly into the kernel. And the other thread will uh, start a packet capture using uh, PCAP, which is the same library behind Wireshark and TCP dump that will allow us to snoop network packets um, in promiscuous mode. Uh, I wrote a proprietary ring buffer that allows us to basically take a snapshot of network traffic on a server. And uh, once we have that snapshot of, of network traffic, we're able to uh, begin looking for a specific payload inside of the network traffic. So the way the whole thing works is we, we effectively trigger the entire program using this probe right here. So it doesn't matter which TCP service is listening on a Linux computer, as long as something is listening over TCP, you're fine. And you can send a, uh, a bad checksum TCP packet with a payload attached to the server. And the rest of the, uh, the root kit here is able to find the payload and then execute it directly on the server as root. So how we form our packet, and, and this is the whole constraint of, of the, the, the test environment that we were working against, was we needed to get this entire thing triggered over a single teeny tiny packet. In fact, we can, we can remote execute a command on a server in less than 80 bytes over a network, which was specifically what we wanted to test against and specifically what we wanted to defend against. Um, so if, if you know how in mapping works and, and port knocking works. This is this is very exciting because you can you can do a lot with a single send packet for uh, as far as I can tell for the first time. So um, we have a, a normal TCP IP header here, 
And we, we have this checksum field, which if you know how to read this diagram, you'll, you'll know that um, each one of these cells here represents a single byte. And you, you move along as you're building your packet. And we basically miscalculate this checksum on purpose. And that's how we trigger BoopKit. So eBPF for debugging purposes allows us to uh, take a bad checksum packet and alert and, and send that out to user space for debugging purposes. And that's actually the mechanism that we use to trigger the rootkit. Um, so in this case, we can attach any payload we want, right? Any Linux command in the whole world. You could type ls, you could type bash, you could type, you know, cat etsy shadow, you know, any Linux command in the world is viable here. And we just embed that directly into the packet of the, uh, of the send packet there. So uh, I'll do two quick demos here when we get to the end of the, the presentation, and I'll actually show you how to find the rootkit and how to, how to exploit a server and uh, how we were able to defend against it. So in our demo, we have two computers. We have one computer named Alice, and we have another computer named Emily. Uh, Alice is uh, ending with this .100 IP address, and Emily is ending with this .100. 200 IP address, and we will uh, be able to show you directly on my, my computer here how this works. Uh, in the case of the demo, we're able to send a TCP packet with our embedded payload, which is our first boop across the network, and that is going to trigger um, our rootkit on the, the remote host. Um, one of the first things we found as we began looking at actually exploiting production servers, which we, we did actually go and install BoopKit on a handful of production servers and uh, try to get um, uh, try to get it exploiting over a few networks. We found that a lot of production hardware is actually dropping these bad checksum packets, uh, specifically in AWS, which is one of the environments we tested against. Um, in order to bypass that, we we thought we could do better. And by that, I mean, I thought I could do better as a hacker in the scenario. And I was able to introduce a second probe using TCP resets um, that allowed for a secondary boop mechanism as well. So it's actually a double boop is what BoopKit will try to do by default. The first one with a malformed checksum and the second one with the, uh, the sin and the reset flag flipped inside of the packet. So you can see here that there's this, uh, this fin flag and there's this reset flag here, um, which is just a single byte that you set to one instead of zero. So the single send packet um, is, this is the one, this is the, the scary one that we were afraid of. And we were able to prove that it would be possible with eBPF to um, exploit a server using only a single send packet. And uh, we're gonna look at the tools we used to prove this out, that it would be possible. Um, so the first one is the malware itself. Um, which BoopKit will try to hide itself using PID obfuscation using eBPF. Earlier, I had mentioned that eBPF allows you to uh, hijack system calls. So there are a few system calls uh, that we were able to intercept and uh, hide the PID from the proc directory running on Linux. So even once the malware started, we're not going to be able to use any of the conventional uh, debugging tools to, to see it. And I'll show you uh, some Linux tools you can use to find rootkits and to find uh, obfuscated PIDs moving forward. I wrote one as well that I gave to Ukraine or the folks I was working with in Ukraine um, called XPID, which uh, there's links um, in, my, in my slides here, which I can share at the end. Uh, BoopKit Boop is effectively the client program. So this uses Metasploit. Um, as a way of uh, framing how the client program works. So if you're familiar with Metasploit, you know that there's lhost, lport, rhost, and rport. And there's a few other commands you can send here uh, that can be used to um, both terminate uh, boopkit malware on a server, as well as uh, run the, the various types of boops against it. And here's like an example command down here at the bottom where we're actually gonna cat Etsy shadow. Cool. Um, I added a script that is, it's a bash script that wraps all the C programs up in bash and makes it very easy to use and demonstrate. So we were able to operate at scale with this. And again, this is Metasploit compatible where we just export these common Metasploit fields here. And then we just run um, our boop script. Um, so after boop kits running, there's two tools, one of which I wrote called XPID um, and another one that I found called unhide that both of these work at kind of like in map, but for Linux PIDs. 
So if you have a rootkit running on a piece of, uh, uh, on a Linux server, um, you can use either of these tools as a way to, to find interesting PIDs that would otherwise be obfuscated to you, the user. Um, I was able to test bootkit with both of these and even uh, bootkit would be, was found by both unhide and my, uh, my tool I wrote here called XPID. And you can read more about each of these tools um, using those links there. Um, these tools should just be things that you have in your toolkit as a DevOps engineer. If if you're if you're dealing with a a security incident, or if you're if you're trying to debug eBPF, um, both of these are going to be things that are going to be helpful as you're you're going through um, working in either production systems or development systems. Um, so let's talk about some of my my research and some of our takeaways, and then it looks like we have about. 15 or 20 minutes left, and um, I'll be able to go through um, and do a demo and answer any questions. So as I move forward, um, if anybody from the DevOps Days Ukraine wants to let me know if, if there's a ch specific chat I should be looking at for questions, um, I'm happy to pull that up and we can, we can talk about it as we move into the demo. Okay, so here's the research here. Um, hiding a pen on Linux is actually a lot harder than it seems. Linux likes to use the slash proc directory, and um, that's not the only place that you're going to be able to hide a PID. So you can hide a PID very quickly from most of the tools, but to, to truly obfuscate a PID on Linux is actually really, really, really hard to do. Um, and we'll I'll show some of that here in a moment once we get bootkit running on my computer. Um, and the short answer here is you should probably never trust any of these traditional tools if you're if you're actually trying to find hidden PIDs or if you're actually trying to look for something uh, that could be running with a kernel module or with an eBPF probe. Um, so PS, top, HTOP, all of these commands read from proc, and, and that's just not necessarily a reliable place to get PID information. Um, and again, eBPF can mutate any system call. So anything that is running in user space or a container, it doesn't matter. It could be a Go program, a Java program. Uh, it could be running in a container. It could just be running with systemd. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can you can hijack it and you would be able to, to spoof things if you needed to with eBPF, which is really cool, um, but also really scary. And you know this is how LD preload works. eBPF just takes it a, a, a step lower and puts it directly into the kernel. Um, so with regard to the network, we were able to do, um, like I said, the bad checksum is kind of the, the whole attack vector behind uh, bootkit, right? You know, you build a custom TCP packet using C, and then you miscalculate the checksum deliberately, and that's what actually is the trigger for bootkit. Um, it can can pass through any TCP service using the bad checksum eBPF probe, but ultimately, um, a lot of network hardware just just will just drop it. Right, it'll just you know before it'll do any TCP fragmenting or anything, it'll just say like, "Yo, bro, you don't you don't have your checksum calculated correctly. We're not even going to entertain the idea of routing this packet or doing anything with this packet." Um, so it's it's a really good way to like get malicious send packets across the wire. Um, but again, like you know, if if you have some network hardware and you really want to pre prevent against something like this, dropping bad checksums uh, is something that you should be doing if you're not doing that already. Um, in theory, you don't want to be using a bad checksum anyway, uh, even if you do get it. So um, the smarter your network hardware, the, the easier it's going to be to defend against this. So that was one of the big takeaways we learned right away. Um, and like I mentioned, Bootkit now tries more than just bad checksum, so it's a little more resilient. And a, a single send packet is very difficult because of network traversal. Uh, in other words, uh, sending a single send packet with a bad checksum, the more networks you touch, the lower the likelihood it'll actually get routed to the to the server. Also, a lot of the the advanced um, defense we were looking at was was more than just exposing an IP address over WAN. We were looking at you know lateral movement once you were inside a LAN anyway. Um, cool. So we did a little bit of research directly with eBPF, specifically the TCP trace point. And we, uh, I found out very quickly that the TCP trace points don't have as much data as you would think they did, they have. So the, the whole reason we have to do the packet capture is because uh, you don't get access to the payload directly in the eBPF probe out of the kernel. So the kernel is very limited on what it returns. In the case of the TCP bad checksum trace point, you really only get 
the um, the source address and the destination address, which is exactly how a lot of things like you know natting and, and routing and, and potentially firewalling is going to work. Um, so that's important to keep in mind if you plan on using TCP or any of the eBPF networking protocols for for anything moving forward. Um, okay, if there's one slide that you as a DevOps engineer uh, take into consideration, it's this slide here. Screenshot it if you if you don't have it already. But this was the big takeaway that I really learned from from debugging eBPF that I, I just want to get this in front of as many people as possible. Go explore these directories on a Linux computer. Like take 30 minutes on your lunch break, go into slash sys and start exploring. Um, slash sys is the new slash proc. And I think you know, if, if a lot of folks in the kernel community have their druthers, slash proc is gonna go away. Go to sysfsbpf and take a look at maps.debug and progs.debug. Um, these are two files that this is a source of truth for all eBPF on your, on your system. If you want to see if somebody's running eBPF on your computer, this is where you go to find it. More importantly, you can, you can correlate the, the values that are in this file into the specific file descriptor info files running in proc. So this is a way for you to use two virtual file systems, slash sys and slash proc, as a way of determining which PIDs are running which eBPF program. And the tool that I wrote, XPID, will do all this for you. So you can just do XPID-B, and it'll just show you every BPF program running on your computer. Um, it's actually a lot harder than it sounds to, to list eBPF programs running on a Linux server. So uh, if you want to see where the rubber meets the road, go explore this directory. Additionally, uh, I would really suggest folks going and exploring the system tracing directory. So this is this is a fascinating place, and I'll, and I'll show folks in a second, but anything that happens in your kernel, whether it's power or thermal regulation or RAM or TCP or networking or system calls, anything that happens in your kernel of your computer, you can find it here and you can you can look at it really quickly. So all of the, t the kernel tracing is now um, compiled directly into the kernel. And all you have to do is just echo the number one into some file that you want to turn on and then you can just cat this file here at the end and you'll be able to see what's going on in the kernel so i'll, I'll show folks here in a moment what that looks like uh, so screenshot this specific thing if you haven't already this trace pipe is what you want to to remember if you want to look at what the what is the equivalent to the syslog for bpf okay um so we found out a lot about how the linux networking stack works which basically uh alluded to using xdp as an extremely fast extremely reliable way of getting network packets out of the kernel and uh xdp happens long before ip tables or or anything else um so if you want to go look at how boopkit uses the packet capture stuff uh you can very quickly see that there's an order of operations that you can obfuscate as you get closer and closer to the network uh, hardware. Cool. So let's uh, let's do a demo. So we are going to we're the goal is going to be to um, get a root shell running in Emily from Alice. So we're going to run Alice as a client, and we're going to try to exploit Emily running here. So all of this is running on my local network, and um, you know, please, if you haven't already. Uh, Please, God, do not run Boopkit on a production server. Uh, developing malware was a, a a new thing for me as a software engineer. Uh, I was more than happy to do it, but like, man, I have forgot on more than one occasion to actually terminate my malware after I've started it. So if you do start playing with this stuff, please be freaking careful because um, this is the real deal and it will absolutely root your server. Um, so, so anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to open up a second terminal here. And hopefully folks will be able to see that we have uh, two terminals running. Um, so here we have here we have Alice. And if I scoot over, we should now have Emily here as well. So I have the latest version of Boopkit checked out. And I am going to compile Boopkit. And you can see it's written in C. And I was able to build some eBPF probes. And I am going to install it. Uh, so I have officially installed Boopkit the malware running on Emily, which is the, the server that we're going to try to exploit here. Um, you can see that we dropped off these .o files in the home directory. 
And these are this is this is where the magic happens. These are the eBPF files that you actually load into the kernel. And if you look at any of the eBPF tools out there, Falco or Celium or or any of these things that we see in Kubernetes, they all have to do the same thing that I'm doing right now. So you can see how this whole thing kind of works. Um, so anyway, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a root shell and I'm going to run rootkit. And you can see uh, very, I'm going to stop it really quick. You can see very quickly here, we started to receive bad checksums and TCP resets on localhost, which 200 is our local IP. So I have this um, flag I can do here and um, we will do, do, do 127.0.0.1. Uh, and uh, you will see that we can we can ignore these these sources coming from uh, other places. And let me stop Docker as well. Docker likes to be pretty noisy with bootkit as well. So the vector is it's noisy to say the least. Um, you'll see that uh, this IP address is coming from Docker, which as soon as I stop it, um, we'll no longer see this. And um, uh, Boopkit is is going to respond to anything. So it's it, at the very least, like it's a very sneaky vector, but it's very noisy. So that was good to know that if something like this did happen, we were going to have to, um, it was going to be easy to find it. So uh, we're going to finish forming the command and then we'll actually run this thing the right way. Um, so we're going to grab the name of our interface we want to listen on. So if you remember, Boopkit listens directly on the network hardware using libpcap. Uh, which means that it doesn't it doesn't matter what's happening in the kernel. It doesn't matter what IP tables is set to. It doesn't matter about your firewall rules. Like none of that junk matters. We are so like we're talking to the network hardware at this point. So it it kind of is like a very alarming situation. Um, but it's cool that that you can sort of bypass a lot of this other stuff that's running on a production system. So anyway, um, we're gonna run Boopkit. We're going to ignore its local interface address, and we're going to ignore uh, local host, and we're going to listen on its actual uh, interface. So this would be uh, the type of command that that somebody would potentially run on a server. And if we open up another terminal here, um, you can see uh, if we ps ox grep boopkit, uh, you can see that we don't act, we're not actually able to find bootkit running locally. This, this entry right here is just the grep for bootkit itself. Um, nothing is running, uh, at least according to PS or top or H top or anything like that. But I mean, you can see it here, you know, bootkit is, is absolutely running. And if you want, you can even see that it's PID does exist. So to kind of show you folks what I'm talking about, um, you can go to the, to the directory and see that you can actually find the PID, but the uh, eBPF probe that I'm using, um, if you ls la and you grep for the name of the PID, there's nothing. There's nothing there. So it's it's pretty alarming that eBPF is allowed to to just completely just like change what you see in the kernel at any point. Like nothing nothing in user space really matters uh, as long as uh, whenever eBPF comes to the party. Um, so anyway, bootkit is running and we're going to go jump over on Alice and we're going to go into the bootkit directory and we are going to make all and we are going to sudo e make install. Okay, so here on Alice, we have bootkit boop running and we have uh, this file here called boop script, which if you remember, this is the, the Metasploit file I had talked about earlier. Uh, you set the remote host, you set the remote port. So if you remember, um, Boopkit works over any TCP service. So if you wanted to do Kubernetes or Nginx or MySQL or, you know, anything in the world that's listening on TCP, you can go ahead and, and grab it here. Um, in this case, just to kind of like mess with people, we decided to use port 22, which is of course SSH, which of course I do not have SSH access to this computer. Um, and, and then you give it the, the, we're doing a reverse shell. So you need to give it the, the address to, to dial back if, if you're familiar with how reverse netcat works. And, and then we, we inject the reverse netcat command directly in the server and we run the thing. Um, so before I actually exploit the server, I wanted to show folks that we can do bootkit localhost 1066100 local port 
Um, any port is fine. Port 80. Remote host. This is 1066-200. And remote port um, 22 for SSH. And for dash C, it can be anything in the world. So in this case, we will run um, ls la. And um, do, do, do. Oh, pseudo boop kit. Um, boop. There you go. And we're going to do a dash X at the end as well. So this is it. So this is our command. It's 83 bytes. It's a single send packet. And I can type any, any Linux command I want and have it execute over this, this remote IP address. So if we were successful, um, you can see here on the server, we were actually able to ls la. And so, um, you know, I can, at this point, I, I've rooted the server, right? I can, I can do any RCE over a single send packet. And this is exactly what we wanted to demonstrate was, uh, with the folks I was working with in Ukraine, that this is something that is a real tactic and it's something we should be aware of and we should be investing and in monitoring our, our network packets substantially more than we are. Um, so just to kind of show folks, I can, I can list Etsy here, um, and, uh, we're not actually getting anything back over the server at this point, but you can see that I am actually doing remote command execution on the back end. And, um, just to kind of show folks exactly how it will work, um, I can run the boop script command, which if this works well, if you look, we're on Alice down here. I can run boop script and um, it'll give me this lovely Python command here, which is known as shell stabilization to anybody who's done any um, remote command execution in the past. And I know it happened fast, um, but we've, we just rooted Emily. Um, so we've, we've got a reverse shell on Emily uh, down here in the bottom. And you can see, I mean, you know, I'm in, right? Like this is this is the whole thing. Over an 80 byte SIN packet, right? One SIN packet, and I was able to dial do a reverse shell into the server. Um, so this was this was the big takeaway, and this was uh, you know what we wanted to demonstrate was actually a possibility. Um, and simply by flipping that bad checksum bit in our our network hardware, we were able to completely annihilate this entire um, possibility of an attack vector here. Um, so anyway, um, once you're in, you can act, it, what's really cool about it is, um, there's only one person logged into Emily right now, as far as Emily is concerned. So this thing is extremely, um, extremely sneaky, right? We, we can't listen to the PID. We have, uh, a new shell, um, right here opened up remotely. And I mean, I can, I can go to temp, I can go to Etsy. It's, it's a shell and I can exit out of it. And you can see, I went from root at Emily right back into Novix at Alice. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop here and come up for air. Um, I, I know we only have two or three minutes left. Um, I'm here for questions and, uh, I have a plethora of resources available. So if folks want to see the code or if they want to talk more, or if they want to understand more about exactly um, how we were able to do this, I want to make myself available. And if folks are watching in Ukraine uh, and want to talk with some of the folks I've been working with, I'm happy to connect people as well. Uh, we just want to get everybody with us as awesome as uh, infrastructure as possible when it comes time to, to keeping everything that's going on in Ukraine as secure as possible. So um, that's it. That's the demo. That's BoopKit. EBPF is sneaky, and um, you know we're happy to show folks good best practices for best keeping practices their networks keeping secure. Their wow, thank you so much. Uh, once again, virtual applause, thunderous, the many Yay! thousands, tens of thousands. Of <laughs> Excellent. Well, that that was uh, uh, a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. Uh, thank you for that. Very dense, very interesting, uh, very compelling. Uh, talk uh, and taking the time out to, to introduce uh, all of us uh, to the work of the research that you've done. Really, really appreciate it. Um, a, co a couple of comments before we dive into the questions. EBPF is voodoo magic. Uh, we've been playing around with it here at Datadog for a while now. We, you know, we, we presented at Blackout last year with with some terrifying findings about you know terrible things to do with EBPF, and I, I feel like we're only at the tip of the iceberg with it. So, 
this is this is interesting and, and powerful and scary, all kind of wrapped into one. Um, you, you mentioned that you would like potentially people to get in touch with you. What's a good way to get in touch with you? Um, I think most of the work that we've done has happened in the Discord. So there's a Discord on my blog um, is a good way to get in touch with me. I'm on the Kubernetes Slack. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitch channel is another good place uh, or just my email address. It's all in my GitHub. And any of those are fine. But I think if you just want to get involved with everybody who's been working on the project, the Discord is definitely the place to go. Okay, excellent. So there are a lot of questions that are coming in. So uh, I will I will just kind of get to them here uh, in, in pseudo random order. Uh, first one real quick. Is it possible to run RMRF slash remotely? Uh, I mean, yeah, you can run any command remotely. I mean, that's probably not going to do what folks think it's going to do. But uh, yeah, you can run the command. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's just say you can run anything. Now, whether we'll have the output and outcome you expect is a different story, right? Yeah, right, for sure. exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, so another question here, uh, are there any logs stored anywhere if needed for troubleshooting or, or further analysis? And I think this is from the perspective of the, the user, the exploiter. Um, okay. But also I'd be interested to know what, if any, are traces that are gonna be left on the, on the attacked machine itself? Yeah, this is a good question. So in order to, to get the malware running, you're 99% you're of the time going to actually have to compile it. So there, there, there's going to be evidence of, you know, downloading a compiler if there doesn't exist already, downloading any dependencies. And there's a high likelihood that like BoopKit doesn't clean up after itself. So if you install BoopKit, you know, it, it hard codes the home directory where it's going to install the, the objects and it'll, it'll put the, the actual binary and user bin and uh, it, it'll leave artifacts behind. Additionally, um, you know, all of, all, everything that we're running is going to persist in memory as long as you can do a memory footprint of the system. And if you want to use any of the forensics tools to look at uh, the mutations on the file system, you'll actually get all kinds of good stuff about you know moving stuff around and copying objects around. Um, as far as eBPF goes, I, I think that uh, any of the system auditing stuff, the Linux audit or any of like the runtime security things, any of the eBPF security tools like Falco, all of those are going to catch this long, long, long in advance because they're just going to be like alerting on things like inserting an eBPF module or a probe in the first place. Um, so it's just, you know, you know, other than the basics for security, uh, there's going to be a few specific artifacts you could go look for, sure. All right, cool. Uh, you know, one of the things you really highlighted was that thanks to the magic of, of eBPF, uh, you can kind of just munge up user space. Uh, this sort of harkens back to, you know, ways to abuse things like I notify in the file system space, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, what, what are some ways that, you know, as, as a system administrator, as a person responsible for machines, we could try to, to mitigate some of this attack service. For example, uh, could kernel dot unprivileged BPF disable help with damage control, uh, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a really, really good question. Um, you know, the rule of thumb with eBPF is like, once you're root, you're all eBPF is, is fair game. So you're not going to really be loading a lot of eBPF module or e I keep calling it modules, eBPF probes, unless you have somehow first gained root, right? So like, if you're looking at any of the, you know, containerized eBPF things, or if you're looking at using it for like a user space component, um, you know, if, if you're giving that tool root in the first place, I think it's safe to say that it's already kind of like has access to the keys to the kingdom. Um, so just being diligent about like, you know, do we let things run privileged or unprivileged? So just because you've given, um, like a container, you know, access to root, but you don't think it's using it. If that container is ever exploited, somebody could load eBPF at that point. So I, I kind of say that, like, I, I, in my mind, I couple, you know, root privileges with eBPF, right? You want to keep that as tightly locked down as possible because, you know, once that's gone, your, your whole system is liable to be, to be munched. Additionally, I mean, look at like, um, some of the, the enterprise runtime environments, you know, there's like, I think it's, it's Fargate doesn't even let you load eBPF at all. They just have it disabled in the kernel, right? They compiled the kernel without eBPF capability, at least last time I checked. Um, so anyway, like there's there's a lot of things you could do about eBPF disabled or just like limiting the system call or using set conf to prevent BPF load. Like there's a lot you can do there. Um, I just want to raise awareness. And that was kind of the point of the exercise was like, this is a thing that you should be aware of and you should be looking at if you're not already. Right, for sure. So I guess, you know, yeah. one of the primary 
mechanisms of defense against this exploit would be to just not compile EPPF into the kernel if you don't need it. Uh, you know, if, if, if those of you are familiar with EPPF, you can use EPPF to restrict EPPF. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of ridiculous uh, ways to go about it. Um, so again, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So, you know, I'll kind of start smooshing them a little bit together. Um, so there's one here, people asking questions about application PIDs. This was, I, I think, imprinted on a lot of people's minds. Um, are there any PIDs that are started with the remote session visible, for example? Are there ways that you, you, you're hiding the PID? This is one of the interesting aspects of, of the kit here. Um, if you're not using standard issue, you know, PS tools, things like this, like how would you go find this hidden PID? What, what are ways you could detect it on a system if you suspected the kit was in place? Yeah, so the the whole PID obfuscation, um, I think actually came from a Datadog eBPF rootkit that was already presented on. Um, it wasn't really a, one of the first constraints we were looking at. I forget where it was, but we, we I took some of sample code that, that gave me the, a lot of the idea in the first place. Um, but that was more or less like a just making it look like a more like a an actual rootkit than, than just demonstrating the the TCP send packet that we were interested in. Um, how you would go about finding it is is you know I think the unhide tool is probably the most comprehensive tool that's going to be the easiest for most people to use. So you can just like it's in the Linux man pages. You can just grab unhide and you can just type it without any arguments and it'll just go find all these PIDs. Um, and the way that it does it is. And this is how my tool that I wrote called XPID works. Is it it just asserts if there's any changes based based off of all of these different types of looking for PIDs. So unhide works by um, running what it calls tests, and it looks directly in the process table. It uses various system calls. It'll look in proc. It'll check for like other remnants on the file system to see if like there's file descriptors open. It'll use lsof. Like there's a lot of different ways. It'll try to build what it thinks a PID might be, and then it, it'll like list it a conventional way. And if those two things don't match, it says like, hey, something's up with this PID. It looks a little fishy. Um, so there's, it's kind of like a checks and balances kind of thing, right? Like let's enumerate all the ways we could possibly look for a PID and then let's run all of those up against the, like the system and see which ones don't match. And I think that's kind of the strategy that a lot of these like mechanisms, um, uh, are, are going for. And that's how XPID works and XPID will find, uh, BPF hidden programs or it'll find kernel modules and it'll do so. The whole thesis of XPID was to work without slash proc. So how how would we look list for PIDs in, in ways other than using procfs file system? So like just because it's not in proc does certainly doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I guess is the big takeaway there. Fair enough, excellent. There are definitely more questions. I think there's a lot more discussion to be had around this. A lot more interest. A lot more things to dive into and whatnot. Uh, this is the sort of thing where maybe we could take into an open space. We could talk about eppf. We could talk about exploits and you know in, in kernel space and whatnot. Uh, but for now, we, we got to keep the, uh, the schedule as close to on track as we can. So I would like to thank you so, so much for coming out a second time to join us for uh, DevOps Days here with, with our friends in Ukraine, with our friends around the world uh, to present on this extremely interesting topic. And I sincerely hope that uh, everybody who you know wants to have a chance to, to talk and contribute gets a chance to do so. Thanks again so much. Thank you.